Hi, everyone, and welcome to Witch Hunt. I'm Josh Hutchinson. And I'm Sarah Jack. Joining us to discuss legal perceptions of witch hunting in India are two distinguished guests who bring a wealth of knowledge and experience to this topic. Our first guest is Ria A. Singh, a third-year law student specializing in human rights and environmental law. Ria has been deeply involved in researching human rights issues and has a particular focus on the legal framework surrounding witch hunting in India. And we're also honored to have Dr. Amit Anand with us. He's an assistant professor of law at Riva University and has recently completed his PhD with a focus on violence against women, including the critical issue of witch hunting. His insights into the legal challenges and societal impacts of this practice are invaluable. In today's episode, we'll explore the historical and legal context of witch hunting in India, discuss the public perceptions that fuel it, and examine the profound impact on victims. We'll also talk about the need for comprehensive legislation and the role of civil society and government in combating this issue. This is a complex and urgent topic, and we're grateful to have Ria and Amit here to shed light on it. So without further ado, let's dive into our conversation about the legal perceptions of witch hunting in India. Welcome to Witch Hunt, everybody. Hi, Josh. Hi, Sarah. Today we have Ria Arya Singh and Dr. Amit Anand back today. How are you guys? Very good, Sarah. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's it's very good to be back here and thank you again for having me. What first interested me when it comes to witchcraft legislation as a whole was when I noticed that in India we have two types of laws. So we have laws against, you know, that criminalizes witchcraft and then we have laws that criminalizes witch hunts, which when I first came across it, I found a bit confusing, right? And I discussed it with my peers and we came to a sort of discussion that, hey, this looks like a cycle. Um, so what really interests me is that we don't have a central legislation for witchcraft, but we undeniably have cases on cases, several of them, uh, gory in detail, very violent on witchcraft, dealing with witchcraft. And those are only the reported ones. So this is a very urgent topic that we're talking about. These are not these are not cases that have reduced um, that we did observe a significant dip during the COVID pandemic era, but these are not cases that have reduced in frequency over the years as one would expect. So witchcraft legislation really is important, and the fact that only a few states have it, despite the cases that we deal with are spread all over different states in India, is pretty relevant and I think uh, important to discuss. Thank you. So, yeah, I'll just add a, a very small point to what Ria said. Uh, and and uh, this is, again, related to uh, not only the legal understanding, but uh, mostly uh, in relation to uh, the ignorance at uh, not only at the community level, but a state level and national level when it comes to why do not we have uh, strict laws or a law that, that covers the entire nation. So, uh, I mean, obviously, this is something that that I I found while I was doing the PhD, and this is again related to not only the ignorance towards understanding gender-based violence, which in some ways has added to the ignorance of uh, treating witchcraft accusations as a form of gender-based violence. So, what I uh, when I was trying to understand why witchcraft accusations happen and why uh, all of this is uh, still very much not considered to be a mainstream topic when it comes to gender-based violence is, is obviously the, the whole superstition, uh, the whole uh, concept of even I and all of that is there. But a large part of this is also about ignoring the reality that's on the ground. So by not treating this particular form of violence as gender-based violence, what has happened is that there is, like how we are rightly pointed out, that uh, people are hesitant or they, they rather ignore uh, instances of, of witchcraft uh, or witchcraft accusations that, although at a very minor scale, uh, do often get reported in national newspapers every now and then. But then again, uh, these are your regional newspapers in, in regional languages, not uh, not in national languages. Oh, sorry, not national newspapers in English 
So a very few people get to know about these things, even if it's being reported by a newspaper that comes out from the same state where it's happening. So it's, again, it's not on the front page. It's tucked away on page 10, 11, somewhere in a very small section, just a few uh, you know, sentences about uh, something like this will happen and, and never a follow-up report as to who the victim was, what exactly happened, was there any justice at the end. So again, this whole ties in to the point about uh, people being ignorant and then not treating this as uh, something that should be treated as gender-based violence. So again, the, the whole question then comes around understanding what gender-based violence is. And this is, uh, this is and, and the last part of thinking is that uh, it, this gender-based violence is just, it's just limited to, you know, uh, to domestic affairs or uh, things that happen in the marital home. And, and that, that ends the matter. But people often do forget that this gender-based violence like similar to the understanding of gender is evolving as we speak. And if we have a holistic approach towards understanding gender-based violence, then perhaps we'll find ourselves in a position to uh, then include so many practices. They might be coming out of you know religious beliefs or superstition or any other factor, but they are then harming a significant portion of the population based on, you know, on just on their gender. So, so this, I, I took this particular route while I was doing the PhD and then the work that I did after that as well, that it comes down to the understanding of what gender is and then what gender-based violence is. And then again, not just gender-based violence within the larger global discourse, but this could mean different things regionally as well. So in the Indian subcontinent, this could mean very different things than perhaps how gender-based violence is seen in Europe or elsewhere. So this this whole this again, I and mean, this this is not a very significant part of the discussion on witchcraft accusations. But again, without this, it it becomes like the whole story is in in some ways incomplete. So just that point about ignoring what this is, and perhaps that's at the root cause of not having a significant, you know, larger legislation which is strict. And the implementation of which is, is very real underground, which is lacking today in India. When we come to examine the bare bones of the law, Bihar and Jharkhand were the two first states that came out with legislation on witchcraft. So Bihar's was called Prevention of Witch Practices Act 1999. Now, as Dr. Amit said, this was essentially to protect women, Right. So the first ever witchcraft legislation was made with this intention of protecting women to eliminate women's torture, humiliation, and killing by the society. This is verbatim what the act says. And even Jharkhand came out with its own law in 2001 after this. So 1999 was when Bihar came out with it, then Jharkhand. Then we had Chhattisgarh in 2005, which is, uh, which is another law. Around 1,500 police cases were reported in the state and over 90% of the women were either widows or women separated from husbands or women with no children, right? So it is very much a gendered issue. But however, I did come across a few cases, a handful of cases that did target men. So there was a case in 2011 in which a man was ostracized based on based off of caste differences and he was buried alive, branded a witch, buried alive. And there are cases like that. So one of my favorite uh, legislations I came across was the one in Karnataka. Now, this does not verbatim say, oh, this is for witch hunt. This this legislation in Karnataka says that it it is against evil and sinister practices and to combat and eradicate other inhuman evil sinister practices. Right? It is considered necessary to create healthy and very social safe environment, a very socially safe environment. And this is especially for women, but it encompasses all people in it. Now, Rajasthan, Odisha and Assam are a few other states, but we don't have central legislation. So Maharashtra and Karnataka do address superstitious beliefs and criminalize ma black magic. And black magic is, again, the occult, right? Occult practices. But they do not mention witchcraft in particular. The state of Odisha, I'd like to repeat, has done several 
sort of outreach programs has has this report that was released uh, in collaboration with Action Aid, I believe. And in their recommendations under civil society is what we can do. A major portion of it was to address the intersectionality of the issue, right? So to link the fact that witchcraft, witch branding, uh, these practices are essentially linked to gender. So women are women face the major brunt of this, and not just gender, but they, but also the patriarchy. So it was something that the report came out with, saying that right, the civil society organizations need to link this issue with the patriarchy, and that was one of the recommendations. I do believe. Now, when it comes to central legislation, we can go in depth uh, further. But the most recent was a bill that was introduced in the Rajya Sabha on, in 2022, 9th December. And it was uh, by the, M the member of parliament of Odisha, Sujit Kumar. And so in the list of business on Friday, December 9, 2022, Sujit Kumar, MP from Odisha, moved for leave to introduce the bill to provide for effective measures to prevent, prohibit, and protect persons, especially women, from witch branding and hunting, to eliminate their torture, oppression, humiliation, killing, sexual assault, stigmatization, discrimination, ostracization, by providing punishment for such offenses, relief and rehabilitation of victims of such offenses, and for matters connected therewith or incidental thereto. Now, this is the one in 2022, right? Now, there's one thing in particular. Most of these criminal acts that are committed, most of the criminal acts that are committed in the name of witchcraft or witch hunting, they are all addressed to some extent in the IPC, in the evidence, in the criminal procedure code, all of these, the three in, in our criminal laws in India. Now, of course, we have, we clearly have acts that penalize these crimes, right? In our, in our Indian Penal Code 1860, we have these. But what we don't have are laws that take care of the relief and rehabilitation of the victims of such offenses. And without substantive evidence, these cases fly under the radar. All of these people are not convicted. The case is just, just gone away. So a specific legislation and why a specific witchcraft legislation is required in each state essentially relies on the fact that we need something that is more holistic in its approach, not just about Criminal, criminalizing the crimes that have been committed, right? So witch branding, witch hunting are lead to ostracization, right? Lead to a lack of education for the families of those that are ostracized. So several cases are heart-wrenching. If you, if you go into details of them, uh, they have been, and they, they occur in rural communities where the people have nowhere to turn to. They have, they are, surviving in forests, living off of sewage water, their kids do not have access to education. In, in such scenarios, what happens is, right, so we have laws in Odisha. We have laws in Karnataka to an extent. But what we don't have are laws in other states where such crimes have been detected and at least have been reported as crimes of witchcraft because they are, the evidence is so strong. So why I mentioned uh, Ms. Behera earlier, who is chairperson of the OCWS, was because we need people in power to really follow this through. We need civil society members to really follow through on pushing these laws, not just as bills, but until they are laws and then further into action, right? Essentially, we do not have a central legislation. We can go into that further uh, when there's question. But when it comes to state laws, we only have them in the states I have mentioned. And we have people that are introducing bills on a national level, the 2022 bill. There was a 2016 bill that did not uh, make it through the rounds of parliament. But we have been seeing progress when it comes to people keeping, keeping momentum in a way. But it is, all, it is all under the radar until the bill does become a law, is signed into the law. Thank you for listening to this episode of Witch Hunt. Please visit Witch Hunt on YouTube. Have a great today and a beautiful tomorrow.